Hello, uh, I am uh, Rui Cardoso, Senior Lecturer for Aerospace Engineering. So uh, this face you are seeing there is my face <laughs> and I'm going to um, um, introduce you to statics. So I'm going to, to show you some sample lectures and tutorials on uh, statics. So if you want for some reason to email me uh, with any query, you have my email address here. And uh, you also have these uh, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, things for Brunel, which you can try to follow. Um, so what I'm going to cover in these uh, sample lectures and tutorials is basically material for uh, your year one at Brunel. So I'm going to cover statics only. Of course, you are going to do many other things, but the main main topics I would like you to to focus is basically the, the first three vector analysis I'm going to give a very quick review of vector analysis with the basics and then I'm going to move to equilibrium of a particle where a lot of vector analysis is required and then I will introduce moment produced by a force vector so these are quite basic and but extremely important concepts that you need to know very well for uh, the remaining of your lectures. Uh, then I will move to uh, the equilibrium, uh, sorry, equivalent system force moment, where you will learn how to basically build an equivalent system that is uh, in the same equilibrium conditions as the original system. That will be very important for the topic that follows, which is equilibrium of rigid bodies, uh, which is the main, uh, the main uh, topic in statics. We, we, will study, okay, we will study many different types of supports. The, the bodies or the, the, the rigid bodies, they need to have supports. They cannot be levitating in the air. Uh, and then we are going to learn how to replace those supports with uh, forces, which are called reactions. And we are going to learn how to derive the equilibrium equations. Uh, basically, these equilibrium equations will, will um, make sure that your body is in, is in equilibrium. And then from those equilibrium equations, you can calculate many different unknowns. Uh, then we will talk a little bit about beams. Uh, we will derive the transverse shear force and bending moment diagrams for beams. So this is a kind of a introductory, uh, introductory uh, video I will have for all these sample lectures. Of course, uh, different lectures will have this same introductory video, but they will refer to different topics on this table of contents, if you want. Uh, another thing you can, if you are more curious, I, I, I have a YouTube channel which you can, if you are interested of course and curious, you can try to see what I had there. So I have a, a lot of lectures in that YouTube channel so you can search for that channel by googling, googling Ricardozo YouTube. Uh, I have lectures for more advanced years uh, so I recommend at this point you not to see those lectures. But um, uh, I also have some supporting material for uh, statics in year one there in YouTube channel. So I think it's a, it's a nice thing for you to, to see as well. I would like also to say that all the examples I will be doing in these lectures and tutorials, uh, not all of them, but uh, many of them were taken from these recommended books I have listed here in this slide. So engineering mechanics statics from Ebler or from vector mechanics for engineers statics from Beer and Johnson uh, from engineering mechanics statics from Marion Bolton and Craig and also from my own book stress analysis for lightweight structures a MATLAB oriented approach so all the examples you will see in the videos sometimes I refer which book I've taken the example sometimes I don't but these are the books that we uh, the, uh, sorry that I, I I follow so in case I forget to mention which book I took the example you have here the list of books uh, so you you know where they came from
All right, thank you. So we will move now uh, to the specific lecture. We will have something like, for example, let's start with a, a clamped beam with a force at the tip, let's say force F, okay? So imagine we have this beam which is clamped. This can be, for example, the wing of aircraft, yeah? The wing is clamped on the fuselage of the aircraft, right? Uh, Okay, so what we have to, to, to do in this kind of examples first is calculate the reactions, okay? And this kind of support, if you do the free body diagram of this beam, I'm going to do here below. So we have the beam, we have the external force, in this case this force at the tip. And we need to include now the reactions, so we we did break the connection of the beam with the support, right? So I need to replace that support with the reactions. And the reactions I will have are, so we can also say this is, for example, point A, this is point B of my beam. Uh, the reactions I will have at point A are going to be a horizontal, a x, a vertical, a Y, yeah? And because the beam is clamped at point A, I will have a moment as reaction. So I will have to consider this moment MA, which is a reaction, okay? And now, once I have the, the reactions, what we do is so, I mean, once, once we have this free body diagram, yeah, this is my coordinate system, x, y, what we do is we write the equilibrium equations, as you know, summation of forces in the x direction equal to zero, you get ax equal to zero, yeah, summation of forces in the vertical direction equal to zero, you get ay minus f equal to zero, so f the force F that you have at the tip of the beam is given, yeah? I really think this doesn't make too much difference, right? But anyway. And then you can see from this equation that AY is going to be equal to F. So the reaction at A, the vertical reaction, is going to be equal to the force F, external force F. And from the third equilibrium equation, summation of moments about A equal to zero, we, what do we have? Well, we have the moment MA as reaction. We need to consider MA, yeah? AX and AY, they don't produce any moment about point A. They are passing on point A. We have to include now the moment produced by force F about A. That is going to be a clockwise, so negative. So let's say, for example, let's give some... This distance from here to here is L, for example, generic distance L, okay? So the moment produced by F about point A is going to be minus L times F, yeah? So it's the distance times the force. And that's all the moments we have about point A. So from this equation, you can calculate the moment MA, yeah, the reaction moment MA, as being equal to L times F. Yeah? So we calculate the reactions. So nothing new so far. That's what we have been doing during these weeks. Calculate the reactions. And what I want you to realize now is these two reactions we calculated, AY, AY and MA, yeah? They are basically the reactions at this section plane 
of my beam. Yeah, this section at point A, this section at point A, as you can see there, I have the a transverse force AY equal to F, and I have a moment MA equal to LF, right? What if, for example, I don't, I, it's quite easy. All right. So as I was saying, we calculated the, the force AY and the reaction moment MA, which are basically the, the force and moments at this section A of my beam. But what if I want, for example, to know what is the moment about this section. So let's say this section is at a distance, let's say a distance x, a generic distance x from point A. What is, what I want to know now is what is the shear force and the bending moment at this section at the distance x from point A. Okay? That's what I, we are going now to pursue is what is the shear force? We usually call this transverse shear force V as a function of X. Okay, so we are going to define a section plane in my beam at the, dis at the generic distance X from point A. And then I'm going, to, I'm going to try to calculate the transverse shear force V X and the bending moment with which we will call mx. The reason, yeah, just a moment. The reason why we have this x is because, as you can imagine, this shear force v and bending moment m they will change with the section plane I use for my beam. So if I cut my beam in these different section planes, basically I will have different <laughs> shear forces v and different bending moments m in different points or in different cross sections of my beam. Okay? Yeah, you're going to ask something? Uh, what is the nature of the shear force? Sorry? What is the nature of the shear force? The nature of the shear force. Uh, well, the shear force is, basically it will create um, a distortion or a, um, uh, how to say, um, <laughs> so for example, imagine you have, you have this block Okay, if you apply a, a shear force here, what is going to happen to, to this block is it is going to distort. Okay, this distortion angle is because of the, the action of this uh, shear force. Okay, yeah, that's why we call shear. So it's a kind of shear or distortion of the cross sec of the of the beam. All right. Okay, so I'm going to, I need some space, so I'm going to delete this, this one here. Uh, all right, so let's do something like this. So let's define, let's define this section in my beam, this one here. Okay, at the distance x, generic distance x from point A. And what I'm going to, so like we did in the method of sections last week, so when I use the section plane, I have two options. I look at the left side of the section plane, or I look to the right side of the section plane, right? So let's say, for example, that I'm going to look to the left side of my section plane, so I will then do something like this, okay? So, this is going to be my new free body diagram. <coughs> Looking at left side. <coughs> now, if I do only this, do you think this left side of my section plane is going to be in equilibrium? So what I look, for example, if you, if you try to do something like this, summation of forces in the y direction equal to zero, what do you get here? You get AY, yeah? 
What else? Sorry? Yeah, yeah, no, but looking at this free body diagram that you have there in the whiteboard, okay? Without anything else, AY is the only force we have in the vertical direction, isn't it? So, do you think AY is equal to zero? No, it's not. AY, we have seen before, is equal to F, isn't it? So, this free body diagram here is not in equilibrium, yeah? So, in order to restore the equilibrium, what I have to do is I have to include a shear force that I will call Vx, okay, in my section plane. So the plane I'm using to cut my beam, I'm going to include in that section plane a shear, a transverse shear force Vx, and now I can say from the equilibrium of the forces, for, from the summation of the forces in the vertical direction, I will have Ay minus Vx, yeah? That's all we have. Now this needs to be equal to zero. So from this equation, uh, can I just do one thing? Let me replace the Ay by F. We calculated the, re the reactions before, right? So this is going to be F, and this moment here is LF, okay? And Ax is equal to zero, right? We concluded this when we calculated the reactions. So I can also say here, instead of Ay, I will have F. And now from this equation, I can say Vx is going to be equal to F. You all agree with me? What about the summation of moments? Summation of moments, and now when we are using a section plane to cut our beam, we are going always to calculate the moments about the, a point in the section plane, okay? So summation of moments are going to be evaluated about this point here on the section plane, all right? So if I do that, the summation of moments needs to be equal to zero to be in equilibrium. All right, so Vx, so this Vx does not produce any moment about that point on the section plane. I have the moment produced by the reaction moment, Lf, I need to include. So Lf here, okay? I have the moment produced by this force F, which is how much? Positive or negative? Negative. So I need this distance. You agree with me? Which distance is this? X. So minus X times the force, which is F. Yeah? And this is all I have. So, do you think this is going to be equal to zero? This will never be equal to zero, right? So this, imagine for example, this L is, imagine it is one meter, for example, this L. This x is going to be lower than one meter, right? So this will never be equal to zero, right? So this will never be equal to zero. So what I have to do is, in order to, have, to restore the equilibrium, I need to add also a bending moment on the cross section, mx. Yeah? So this section plane will need also to have a bending moment, mx, and now, I need to add this bending moment mx in my equilibrium equation for the moments. And this needs to be equal to zero to be in equilibrium. And now I can solve this for mx, which is going to be equal to fx, or sorry, xf, doesn't matter, minus lf, or if you want, is going to be equal to f x minus L, yeah? Okay? And now look what, I, what I'm going to do now. So basically I obtained two equations, these ones here in these boxes. One for the shear force or for the transverse shear force Vx 
and another equation for the bending moment mx. And as you can see, they are function of this x variable. Well, vx is constant, always equal to f, but the moment varies linear, linearly with the x coordinate. Yeah? So what I can do with these equations is something like this. Maybe I can just copy. Oh, I can. So our initial beam was this one. Yeah? So this is one, uh, this is L, oops. This is L. So what I can do is, I can now, so this is point A, this is point B. I can now do something like this. I can, <coughs> I will represent here these diagrams. In this one, I will rep represent the shear force Vx. And in this one, I will represent the bending moment Mx. So I will need to have these two equations. So Vx equal to F. I can write them here. Vx equal to F. And for the bending moment, I have this equation Mx equal to Fx minus L. Okay? And what I'm, don't forget that my x variable starts at point A. So my x variable starts at point A, yeah, as origin at point A. So let's start with this one for the shear force. Vx equal to F, always constant. So it means. I will have for Vx this distribution of my shear force along my beam. Yeah? So what, what does this diagram tell us? At any point of my beam, my transverse shear force Vx will always be equal to F, constant and equal to F. What about the bending moment? Look at this. We obtain this equation for the bending moment. So F is a linear, uh, M is a linear equation in my x coordinate. So it's going to be the equation of a line, right? Yeah? So in order to have the equation of a line, in order to draw this line, I need two points. If I have two points, I can then draw the line, right? So let's start with the first point for x equal to 0. That means section A of my beam, isn't it? Yeah? So if I replace here x by 0 in this equation, x by 0, I get my bending moment equal to minus FL. So let's say this point here is going to be minus FL. I need another point to draw the line. That other point is going to be point B. Point B means x equal to L, isn't it? So if I replace in this equation x by L, I get bending moment 0. Yeah? L minus L is equal to zero. So I get this point here is the zero, Benny moment. So if I connect these two points with a, with a line, then this is going to be my distribution of my Benny moment. Why is this important? Because as, as you are going to see next year, we are going to study bending analysis, OK? When you design something like, for example, a beam uh, for bending analysis, you need to be looking for the maximum bending moment on the beam. Yeah? So that's why these diagrams are extremely important. Because from these diagrams, you can see that the critical section of the beam, the one with the highest bending moment, is this one here, which corresponds to the root of the beam, or uh, the section at point A of my beam, right? Is where I have the maximum bending moment installed. OK? So you are going to learn in year two, not uh, here because we don't have time, but in year two, you are going to learn to design the beam for bending behavior, for transverse shear. So for bending behavior, you need to be looking at the bending moment diagrams, like this one. For the transverse shear, you need to be looking at the transverse shear force diagrams, like this one. 
Okay? Another very interesting thing, another very interesting thing you need to, to consider is, <clears throat> okay, so let's go back here. <clears throat> so let's go back to this initial problem here. So we decided to cut our beam with this section plane and look at the left side. But if I decide to cut my beam in the, so it's better to draw it here again. If I decide, so I have my beam with the force here on the tip, this one, F, okay? If I decide to cut my beam here now with this section plane, and if I decide to look at the right side, that is also possible, <coughs> all right? And how would I do that? So if I decide to look at the right side, I will now define my X coordinate starting, so this is my point B of my beam, right? I will get my X coordinates now starting at point B and going to the left, so the positive X is to the left. And I will have now to consider my transverse shear force VX, sorry, now going up and my bending moment clockwise yeah so whenever so it's it's quite easy in a beam whenever you cut a beam with a section plane you always need to put in that section plane a transverse shear force v and a bending moment m okay you always need to do that now if you compare this situation with this one when we looked at the left side with this one okay so I'm going to, to do this. So we have, so I'm going to draw the beam here again. Maybe it's easier. And now I'm going to look, to consider two section planes, this and this, okay? And I'm going to look at this region of the beam between these two section planes, okay? So I'm going to, get rid of this one and get rid of this one and only look at this portion of the beam that is between these two section planes. Now, when we use this section plane here, this one, if you look at this one, it means I have the beam on the left side of this section plane, right? So I need to include my shear force V like this and my bending moment anti-clockwise like this in this section plane, okay? Now, if I look now at this section plane, for this section plane, the beam is now on the right side of this section plane, right? So I have a situation equivalent with this one, yeah? So it means I need to include a transverse shear force going up, like this one, yeah? And the bending moment, and the bending moment that is going to be clockwise. Okay? So I don't know if you are seeing what I'm doing here. So I'm considering in my beam two sections plane, two section planes. So for one section plane, our beam is on the left side. And for the other section plane, the beam is on the right side of the section plane. Okay? And we need to represent these initial orientations for the shear force V and for the bending moment. Exactly, exactly like this I represented here. Okay? Why? Because if we don't do this way, if you look, if you try to do summation of forces in the vertical direction equal to zero, what do you have? You have Vx, this one here on this section plane, minus Vx, which is this one on the other section plane, equal to zero, which is correct. Yeah? I'm keeping equilibrium. Same thing for the moments, right? If you do summation of moments equal to zero, this equilibrium equation, in this section plane here, you have a anti-clockwise bending moment, so you have a positive mx, but in this section here, in this section plane, you have a clockwise bending moment, so you have minus mx, and they cancel each other, so at the end, this is in equilibrium, right? So everything needs to be always in equilibrium. Everything, any section, any portion of the beam you consider needs always to 
respect the equilibrium equations. That's why you need to have this convention for the section planes you are using to cut your beam. And you need to be careful. If you are cutting and looking at the left side of the beam, you need to use this initial orientation. If you are cutting the beam with this section plane and looking at the right side of the beam, then you need to use this other uh, initial orientation for the shear force and bending moment, okay? All right? So, going back to our example here, so I will delete this now. Going back to, don't forget what we did here was we consider the beam, we use a, a section plane, and now we are looking to the right side of the section plane. So this is my free body diagram. If I do summation of forces in the y direction equal to zero, I have Vx minus F equal to zero. So it means I have Vx equal to F. Yeah? If I do summation of moments about this point on the section plane, we always calculate the moments now about the point on the section plane, equal to zero, we get minus mx, so this is a clockwise bending moment, yeah? Minus xf equal to zero, so it means mx is going to be equal to minus xf. And now you might be thinking, okay, so we have now these two equations for the shear force and for the bending moment. And if you compare with these previous two, for example, if, if you look at the, when we look at left side of section plane, we obtain this equation for the bending moment, F times X minus L. And it is quite different from this one, isn't it? This one is minus XF. So does this mean we have a different distribution of the bending moment when we look at the left and when we look at the right side of the beam? Should it be possible? Shouldn't we have the same, exactly the same distribution? So what, what I mean is that, shouldn't I have exactly the same distribution of the bending moment, independent if I look at the left side of my section plane or if I look at the right side of the section plane? I need to have the same, right? So let's see if we have the same or not. So I propose now, for us to draw the, uh, the diagrams. Okay, so this is our beam. So let's plot the, the diagrams again. Shear force diagram here. Bending moment. Yeah? So we have, for the shear force, Vx equal to F. V x equal to f. So this is constant and always equal to f, right? So this is f, right? So this is the same as, we, as this one we obtain when we look at the left side of the section plane. So for the transverse shear force, we get exactly the same distribution of the transverse shear force. For the bending moment, we have mx equal to minus xf. Don't forget now that our x is starting at point B, yeah? When we look at the right side of the section plane, our x has origin at point B. So you can say something like this. This is my x. So x equal to 0 means we are at point B of the beam, yeah? So if I replace here x by zero in this equation, I get the bending moment equal to zero for x equal to zero, so this point. Yeah? Now, if I replace x by L, I will be at point A, or at the root of the beam, right? And if I replace x by L, I will have bending moment equal to minus LF, so it means I will get something like this point, which is minus LF. So yeah, I have these two points. Again, this equation is a linear uh, equation in X, so it's the equation of a line. 
So if I have two points, I just connect these two points with the line, and I have this distribution for the bending moment. And if you compare with the one we obtained before, it's exactly the same. So this point is always is also minus LF. Yeah. This point is zero. Linear distribution, which is exactly what we obtained here. Zero minus LF. As it should be, right? Uh, so, conclusion is, it doesn't matter. So, you have a section plane. You can look at the left side of the section plane, or you can look at the right side of the section plane. As far as you represent these initial orientations properly. Yeah? Like I, I, I told you before. Okay? Uh, another, another thing we can, we can conclude from here is that in this example, we had our, our beam like this, right? If I ask you, for example, in the, in the exam, calculate the shear force and bending moment diagrams for this beam, you don't have necessarily to calculate the reactions. Well, if you use a section plane like this, and if you look at the left side of the section plane, then yes, you need to get the reactions first. But if you, if you use a section plane like this, and if you look at the right side like we did here, yeah, as you can see, we obtained the diagrams without calculating the reactions, right? Yeah, wasn't it? Another very important thing you can get from this is, do you remember, well, we calculated the reactions first and we obtained these reactions, right? So this is, was the first thing we did, right? We obtained AY equal to F and the bending moment equal to LF, yeah? So keep this in mind, please, because what I'm going to show you now is, look, if I am at this section plane, so I'm going to delete this, Section plane at point A, so this is my point A. For this section plane, so I have these two guys, right? Yeah, shear force V and Benny moment. So I'm going to represent this here. Shear force V and Benny moment clockwise, initially MX, okay? I have this at, yeah, when I look at the right side of my section plane, this configuration, right? I get this initial orientation for the bending moment and shear force, right? Bending moment clockwise, shear force going upwards, right? That's what I'm doing here for section plane at A. Look, I have a section plane at A. I'm looking at the right side of my section plane. So I need to have this initial orientation for Vx and Mx. You agree with me? Yeah? Now look at this. Vx is equal to F. So. I will replace now here in this section plane at A, Vx by F. And compare this with the reaction we obtained for Ay. Look at this. F, yeah? So Vx at section A is equal to the reaction at A, equal to F, yeah? Now let's see the moment. What happens to the moment? The moment at section A, so is this section here, right? So is this section here in my diagram. The moment is equal to minus LF. Minus LF, right? That's what we obtained in the diagram. So minus means what? I need to reverse the initial orientation I gave to my moment. So instead of being clockwise like this, it needs to be anti-clockwise. Oops. Anti-clockwise. And the absolute value is, for the moment, is LF. So it means in section A, my Benny moment diagram is telling me that I need to have an anti-clockwise moment equal to LF. So what was the reaction moment we calculated before at point A, at support A? Anti-clockwise LF, right? Yeah? So look at this. When we decided 
here to cut the beam with this section plane here and look at the right side, we didn't have to calculate the reactions, as you can see from here, right? We could obtain the diagrams for shear force and bending moment without calculating the reactions. But at the end, after getting the diagrams, I was able to get the reactions at point A from the diagrams. Yeah, that's what I just show you here. I was able to get the transverse shear force at A equal to F, like we obtained when we calculated the reactions, and I was able to obtain the reaction moment at A equal to LF, uh, anti-clockwise reaction moment, okay? So, the shear force and bending moment diagram, so we use, usually de 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 uh, define this or uh, call this shear force diagram, this one, as F, and this, the bending moment diagram. It's very common to see this in books. And uh, these two diagrams, they basically give you a full picture of what is going on at every single cross section of your beam. What is the transverse shear force that is there, and what is the bending moment that is installed in that cross section? Okay? Yeah? All right, before we continue, one, just one important thing that we need to discuss. I don't know if you realize what's going on here, but just, I just want to make sure that you are, you are getting this. And I'm going to give you a, an analogy, okay? With, you know, you all play this uh, game, the tug war. You all play this? Yeah, so basically you have what in tug war? You have a, a, a rope, right? And you have, let's say, team A and team B. Yeah? So team A have two, two members, and team B will have three members, for example. Okay? All right? So, basically what these guys are doing is they are, they are uh, pulling. So, this team B is pulling the, the cable with this force, let's say, FB. And this uh, team A is pulling the cable with this force, FA. Yeah? And if the, they are in equilibrium, so basically if this, uh, uh, this cable is not moving anywhere, they are in equilibrium. This means that summation of forces in the x direction equal to zero. It means FB minus FA equal to zero. So this means FB equal to FA. Isn't it? Yeah? So they are in equilibrium. That this is the situation. Now, I go there with a scissor and I cut the the cable, okay? So I cut the cable with a section plane. Yeah? And what happens to these guys? So if I cut the cable, let's look at team A. What is going to happen to, to team A? <coughs> so let me get rid of team B. So I, I just did cut the cable, right? So do you think these guys in team A will be in equilibrium? Or do you think they will fall down, right? Because summation of forces in the x direction is no longer equal to zero. Yeah? So in order to restore the equilibrium of team A, what I have to do is I need to include in this section plane a force in my cable in the opposite direction, which is equal to FA. Right? Or, or FB, because FA needs to be equal to FB. But anyway, in this case, equal to FA. And now I can say that my equilibrium will, is going to be verified because I will, get, I will have FA minus FA, then equal to zero again. So I restore the equilibrium. So basically, this force that you have here on this section plane is the internal force in the cable that is able to keep these two teams in equilibrium, right? Yeah? 
So when I cut the cable, I need to... So I'm breaking down that connection on the cable, so I need to include the internal force on the cable. In this case, is an axial force Fa, right? That's exactly the same thing that is happening with the beams. Look, I have the beam here with this force F at the tip, and this beam is clamped at A, right? This beam, so this is point B, this is point A, is clamped at A, and this beam is in equilibrium under these conditions. That force F and the reactions at the support at A, they are in equilibrium, right? So if I decide to come here and to cut the beam to break the connection on the beam in this, with this section plane at this position, I'm destroying the equilibrium, and the only way for me to restore the equilibrium is by adding this shear force and bending moment. And that is the difference between the beam and the example of the cable in the tug war. In the tug war, the forces I had to include in the cable was the axial force in the cable. In the beam, I always have to include a transverse shear force and a bending moment. That is the main difference, okay? The beam is going to be in bending. Yeah? Okay? Uh, just one more thing. The, the situation you saw in the, in the, in the video, uh, before we do the break, just one, one very quick thing. In the video I show you the first one, you could see that he was talking about uh, having compressive uh, forces in the beam together with tensile forces, right? The reason is, look at this, if you have an initial beam like this, Okay? So let's consider this axis here, we call this the neutral axis. You are going to learn in year two, I don't want to go into my, too many details. Imagine this beam is in bending, so you have a bending moment here like this, and a bending moment here like this. It's bending the beam, so the deformed configuration of the beam is going to be something like this, right? I'm going to exaggerate the deformed configuration, yeah? This one in red is the deformed configuration, and you can see that OK, I'm going to use the, the green color here. Above this natural axis, this, um, these points, so if, if you compare um, these points here are going to be uh, compressed, right? In order to, to have this curvature on the beam, you need to be pushing, you need to be pushing these points on, on this top uh, layer of the beam. You need to be pushing them, compressing them. So you will have here a, a, a negative, negative uh, forces above this neutral axis. On the other side, below this neutral axis, so in this region here, these points, they are going to be stretched, okay? So it means they are going to be in tensile. So you are going to, to have uh, um, positive forces there. So if you represent in a cross section the distribution of the forces on the beam, you will have something like this. Negative forces going in this direction and positive forces going in the opposite direction, OK? So for this cross section of the beam, you will have regions, this region where you will have the points are, going, are being compressed, and you will have another region here below where the points are being stretched, OK? Uh, that's what he was referring in the video. So that is also another difference, for example, when you compare beams with the struts we did in previous weeks, right? Strut is in tension or in compression, and all points in the cross section are in tension or compression. Beams in the cross section, you have some points in tension, some points in compression. Yeah? That is because of the bending of the beam. Yeah? OK, so let's do a five minutes break. And then we continue after five minutes, OK? All right. Um, let's do another example here. I, and I will take this example to introduce the Distributed loads, okay, in beams, which is something very common, is, for example, to have a beam like this, a clamped beam again, but now the load 
on this beam is, for example, something like this. A uniform distributed load This is quite common. Bridges, again, aircraft wing. The lift is a distributed load with elliptical shape, for example, right? That is the ideal one, but it doesn't matter. So you have this kind so, uh, of, of loading for the beams. So this distributed load, uh, uh, the data can be given to, or this load can be given to you something like this. Uh, for example, 10 kilonewtons per meter. Yeah? So basically, this is telling you that you will have 10 kilonewtons, kilonewtons distributed over a length of one meter. Yeah? So if you have a beam, for example, like this one with three meters, three meters, so it means you will have a total load on the beam of 10 kilonewtons meter times three meters, 30 kilonewtons, right? Yeah? which basically corresponds to the area, if you look carefully, the area of this rectangular distributed load or uniform distributed load is the area of this rectangle, right? So this, this height here is 10 kilonewtons per meter. The width is three meters. So the area of this rectangle is three times 10 is equal to 30 kilonewtons, yeah? Isn't it? Yeah. <coughs> Why am I doing this? Because I can, in fact, replace the distributed load with an equivalent load. And that equivalent load is, so let, let, let me write like this, force equivalent, a Q is going to be equal to the area of my distributed load. So if I have a rectangular distributed load, the area is the area of a rectangle. If I have, for example, a triangular, some, imagine I have something like this. A beam with a triangular load. Yeah? I can have something like this. My equivalent force in this case, so this is the equivalent force for this case. For this case, my equivalent force, so imagine, imagine this is 10 kilonewtons, this height here. This is also three meters, yeah? My equivalent force for this triangular distributed load is going to be the area of this triangle, which is 10 times three over two. Or in this case, it's going to be 15 kilonewtons, yeah? So for the example, at the top, with a rectangular distributed load, I have an equivalent force of 30 kilonewtons, is the area of the rectangle. For the example of, on the bottom, I will have an equivalent force of 15 kilonewtons, which is the area of the triangle. All good, but the thing is, okay, I have this equivalent force, where, do, where am I going to put this equivalent force? Yeah? And the answer is, I heard somewhere at the centroid. So, Starting with the example here on the top, having, having this beam with this rectangular uh, distributed load or having an equivalent beam with a concentrated load of 30 kilonewtons, 30 kilonewtons, and this 30 kilonewtons needs to be located at the centroid of the rectangle at a distance. So this distance from here to here needs to be equal to 1.5. The distance from here to here, 1.5. And I can then say that these two systems, this and this, yeah, they are equivalent, right? Oh, I think... They are equivalent. Okay, so basically there are, it is two rules you need to know for distributed loads. One is to calculate the equivalent force, which is always the area of your distributed, uh, the area of, well, the geometric shape of your distributed load, right? It's the area. And then the other thing you need to know is where do you, are you going to put 
that equivalent force always at the centroid. So for a rectangle, rectangle is quite easy. For a triangle, the centroid. So I can build an equivalent system for this triangular beam by building an equivalent system where my f equivalent force is going to be at the centroid of the triangle. So this is the centroid and this distance is from here to here. This distance is two thirds of the width, in this case, three meters. So it's going to be equal to two, yeah? So I will have here this equivalent force of 15 kilonewtons, 15 kilonewtons, and this distance from here to here is going to be two thirds of the width or of the length of my beam. Two thirds of three is going to be two meters. And this is going to be one meter, okay? So these two systems are equivalent. Right? I can give you another proof of this. For example, if we go if we go to our rectangular This uh, distributed load, okay? So 10 kilonewtons meter. What I'm going to do is something like this. Uh, I'm going uh, to calculate the reactions, okay? So the reactions for this, so I'm going to use the same figure here. Reactions, we are going to have a y, so this is point A, and we are going to have a bending moment M A. We also have A x, but A x is going to be equal to zero, right? Quite trivial. So if you do summation of forces in the vertical direction equal to zero, you will get A y. Yeah. So I'm going to replace this distributed load with a concentrated force. I'm going to represent here in red. So this force in red is going to replace my distributed load. And this force in red is equal to the area. Uh, I forgot to include here the, this distance is three meters. Yeah, the length of my beam is three meters. So this equivalent force is going to be three times 10. 30 kilonewtons, 30 kilonewtons. Look at the, the centroid, so this distance from here to here is 1.5 meters. So summation of forces in the y direction equal to zero, we have Ay minus 30. Okay, you need not to ignore the rectangular load, right? It's being replaced by this concentrated force in red of 30 kilonewtons, okay? Equal to zero. Yeah? So it means my reaction Ay is going to be equal to 30 kilonewtons. And if I do summation of moments about point A equal to zero, I get Ma. Now, I'm going to look at the 30 kilonewtons, not the distributed load anymore. So this 30 kilonewtons produces a clockwise moment about A, so minus, the distance is 1.5 times 30. This needs to be equal to zero, so conclusion is my reaction at A is going to be equal to 45 kilonewtons meters, yeah? Okay, so reactions. Now, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to use the same example, calculate the reactions at A, but I'm going to do a slight variation. So, uh, a very small variation. This is our initial problem, right? What I'm going to do is, just to, to, to make a point to you, I'm going to divide this distributed load into triangles. So I have a rectangular distribution here. I'm going to divide that rectangular distribution into two triangles. 
And then I'm going to calculate the reactions from that, those two triangles. And we need to get the same reactions at the end, OK? Yeah? So if I divide these into triangles, I will get something like this. This triangle in red and this triangle in blue. Yeah? OK? So for the triangle in blue, so of course, we are going to keep the same dimension. So this is 3 meters. And my original loading is 10 kilonewtons per meter Yeah, of my rectangular distributive load. So these two, now let's look now at these two tri uh, triangles. The one in red, I'm going to replace this triangular distribution in red with an equivalent force at the centroid of this triangle. So I'm going to replace it with this force here in red. This force is equal to the area of the red triangle, which is 3 times 10 over 2. And this distance from here to here is one third of three meters, so it is one meter. Is the location of the centroid of a triangle. And now I have the triangle in blue. I'm going to replace this triangle in blue with a concentrated force located, so in blue and located at the centroid of this triangle in blue. <laughs> This force is equal to the area of this triangle in blue, which is also equal to 3 times 10 over 2. And this distance from here to here is now 2 meters. Yeah? Or 2 thirds of 3 meters, which is 2. And now I will calculate the reactions at support at A. Let's see what we have. So again, our reactions, they need to be, well, we will have a Y here, right? Yeah, a Y, and we will have MA, as before, from the summation of forces in the Y direction equal to zero. We get a Y minus the concentrated forces from the red triangle, which is 3 times 10 over 2, minus the concentrated equivalent force from the blue triangle, which is 3 times 10 over 2. This needs to be equal to 0. So from this equation, we get AY equal to uh, 15 plus 15, 30 kilonewtons. OK? Now the second. Equilibrium equation, summation of moments about A equal to zero. You get MA. The moment produced by this e equivalent force for the red triangle is going to be clockwise. So minus the distance is one meter. One times the force, which is three times 10 over two. And we need not to include the moment produced by this equivalent force for the blue triangle, about point A. And that is minus as well. The distance is now 2 meters, right? Times the force, which is 3 times 10 over 2. From this equation, you, we get MA equal to, this one is 15, and this one is 30. This is equal to 45 kilonewton meter, which is exactly the same as the one we obtained before for the rectangular, for the rectangular distributed load, right? Yeah? So this is one more proof that when you replace a distributed load by an equivalent force, that equivalent force is equal to the area of that distributed load, and the location for that concentrated force is at the centroid, OK? All right, so now let's do
Let's do the same beam. Okay? Clamped beam with a uniform distributed load like this one, 10 kilonewtons per meter. I want now to plot the shear force and bending moment diagrams for a beam with a distributed <coughs> load like this one. Okay? So we have to we have to use a section plane. I can look at the left or I can look at the right side of my section plane. Which one do you want? If you look at the left, you need to consider the reactions, but we calculated already the reactions, right? So we have the reactions, it's fine. If you look at the right, you don't need to calculate the reactions. So which one do you want? The right. So let's look at the right side. Okay? So this is what I have on the right side. Of course, I need to include in my section plane, I need to include my transverse shear force V. Vx and my bending moment Mx. Okay? And my x variable will start at this point <coughs> and go all the way. So x is the coordinate or is the location of my section plane, the one I'm using to cut the beam, right? So if you are looking to the right side of the section plane, you need to start at the tip of the beam, in this case, and then X goes all the way until the section plane, right? Now, the difference from the previous example we did before the break is now that we have a distributed load. So I, I'm going to calculate the shear force and the bending moment for a free body diagram with a distributed load. And what I have to do is, I'm going to use the blue color. I'm going to replace this distributed load with an, an equivalent system with a concentrated force. And this concentrated force is located at the centroid of this rectangle. So my question to you now is, how much is this distance from here to here? From here to here, how much is this distance? X over two, very good. You all agree? So X, X is this total distance, right? So the centroid of the rectangle is at the midpoint, yeah? So it means that this needs to be X over two, yeah? It's the centroid of my rectangle. And this, this, this equivalent force is equal to the area of the rectangle. So this is, this height is 10, yeah? Your 10 kilonewtons meter is this height, this length is how much? X, so this equivalent force is equal to 10 X. 10 X, yeah? Okay? And now we are going to work with this equivalent concentrated force that you have there in blue, 10 X instead of working with the distributed load. And then we can say, from summation of forces in the y direction equal to zero, you will get Vx, what you are looking for, minus 10x, yeah, equal to zero. So from this equation you get Vx, equal to 10x. You get an equation for your transverse shear force, which now is not constant anymore. It's linear with x. And the other equilibrium equation you have is summation of moments equal to zero. Moments about this point on the section plane. Don't forget this. Which moments do you have? Well, you have the bending moment minus mx, so it's clockwise, so minus mx. And you have the moment produced by this 10x 
this equivalent force in blue. And that moment is equal to what? What is the distance? x over 2 times the force, which is 10x. And that's all we have for the moment. This needs to be equal to 0. So from this equation, you get mx. Your equation for mx is going to be equal to minus 5x squared. Yeah? You all agree? <laughs> minus 5x squared. And now we can plot we can plot this the diagrams This is our initial beam right So we are going to plot the transverse shear force here the bending moment here oops And then we obtain Vx equal to 10x and Mx equal to minus 5x squared. Don't forget that my x variable starts at this point. Yeah, this is very important here. Starts at the, don't forget we obtain these two equations for an x variable. Look, an x variable starting at that point on the right end of the beam. This is quite important because now we start with the transverse shear force. We got 10x, so for x equal to 0, we, are at, we have vx equal to 0. We are at this point, yeah? So vx is a, linear, is a linear function in x. So I need another point for x equal to 3, yeah? x equal to 3, we are at the... The, the support. If I replace here x by 3, I get Vx equal to 30. So this point is going to be 30 kilonewtons. And then I have a linear distribution for my shear force. And let's confirm 30 kilonewtons for 30 kilonewtons needs to be equal to my vertical reaction at the support. Is it correct or not? Let's see. We calculated the reactions, right? Ay equal to 30 kilonewtons, yeah? It's always good to do this check at the end, even in the exam, right? To make sure from your diagrams you get the same result as for the reactions. Now, for the many moment, we have a Quadratic distribution now for the bending moment is not linear, it's quadratic. You have minus 5x squared. <clears throat> so, x equal to 0, we have bending moment equal to 0, this point. x equal to 3, we have minus 45. Yeah? So we have this point here, let's say, minus 45 kilonewtons meter, which if you go back is equal to your reaction. Yeah, the signal, we are going to check the signal later. But minus 45, yeah, when you replace here x by 3 in this equation, you get the bending moment equal to minus 45. So we have a quadratic distribution. So we need three points. But in this case, we know that the coefficient is a negative value. So the equation of a parabola. But because of negative value, it needs to have this quadratic distribution, something like this. Yeah? OK? Now, before we, OK, let's, let's check the, the moment as reaction, this minus 45. So don't forget, we have this moment here. We assumed initially clockwise. So when you get minus 45, it means you will have at your section A a clockwise moment and equal to 45. And this compares very well with this 
clockwise moment, MA equal to 45. Exactly the same, right? Anticlockwise in both cases and equal to 45. Yeah? Now, one interesting thing I, I want to show you. You can obtain, you can obtain the shear force V by doing the minus the derivative of the bending moment in order to x. Let's, let's see this case. Our bending moment is minus 5x. So the derivative of the bending moment is going to be equal to minus 10x. The yeah, bending moment is minus 5x squared, sorry. Minus 10x. So if I multiply this by minus 1, I get plus 10x, which is equal to my 10x, vx, all right? Let's see the previous example we did be before the break. What is it? This one. You can obtain vx by doing minus the derivative of the bending moment in order to f. So let's derive this bending moment in order to x. So vx is going to be equal to minus. The derivative of this minus xf in order to x is minus f. This gives you f, which is equal to this one. Yeah? OK? So it's another check you can do in your exam. I will always want you to calculate the shear force and bending moment equations like this. We did. But at the end, you can check if you get things right by doing this der minus the derivative of the bending moment. OK? If you get the shear force, most probably you, get, you got things right. If you don't get the shear force, most probably you have something wrong. Not most probably. For sure you have something wrong. Yeah? That is also another check you can do. All right, so let me see what else. Yeah. Uh, one more thing before we finish. So far, these two examples we did today, we are assuming that there is no variation on the load, yeah, um, on the external loading uh, along the span of, of the beam. What I mean is that, for example, imagine I, I give you an example like this. We can keep the same clamped beam, same three meters. But now I tell you something like this. OK, you will have a distributed load only in this region. And this is one meter. And this is 10 kilonewton per meter. OK? So this is an example is different from the previous ones you uh, we we did. Why? So let's go back to our first example before the break. In this example here, in this example here, so if, if you look at the, the free body diagram, we use it. So we, we use the section plane, we look at the right, right? So it doesn't matter in this example if I cut my beam here, oops, here, or here, or here, or here, or here. Yeah? For all these section planes I have there, if you look at the right side, you will always have a free body diagram equal to this one. I'm circling here, right? Yeah? You agree with me? Yeah. Always. It, it will never change, right? It doesn't matter which section plane I use. However, in this new example I'm giving you, if I cut my beam in this region and look at the right side, I will have something like this. Yeah? You agree? But if I cut my beam in this region now and look at the right side, I will have something like this. So this is going to be one meter. And 
and then this is my section plane I will have here my VX and my MX right these two situations are very different eh? as we are going to see so for a beam like this what we have to do is we have to 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 cut the beam in two different regions of the beam yeah so in this region here in this region here I'm circling here it doesn't really matter too much if I cut here or here or here or here or here or here yeah I will always have a situation like this right agree and the reason is because we are using this generic variable X which it will always be X, right? It doesn't matter which section plane I use. <clears throat> for, this, for this free body diagram here, it also does not matter if I cut my beam here or here or here or here. It doesn't matter, right? Because I will always have my X starting here and going all the way to this point, yeah? So we will have these two situations that we need to do them separately. So starting with this one, I'm going to copy this. Starting with the first one. So what you have to do is, this is your free body diagram. So you quickly write the summation of forces in the y direction equal to zero. You get Vx minus 10x. So don't forget we are replacing this with an equivalent force which is 10x, yeah? equal to zero, so you got Vx equal to 10x, yeah? And for the moments, you do summation of moments equal to zero, so you got what? Minus mx, minus, sorry, minus x over two, which is the distance times the force, which is 10x equal to zero, so you got mx equal to minus 5x squared. Same we obtained before, right? And now you have to do the same thing for, for this free body diagram here at the bottom. I'm going to copy. Yeah, I'm going to paste here. For this free body diagram at, at the bottom, this one here, you need to do again the same thing. The equilibrium equations. Summation of forces in the y direction equal to zero. So let's put the same here. So you got you got Vx. This equivalent force now is going to be equal to the area of this rectangle, which is ten times one. Yeah? Ten times one. So Vx minus ten equal to zero. So Vx equal to 10. As you can see, look at this. This Vx equal to 10 is different from this one, isn't it? Yeah? yeah. Summation of moments equal to 0, you get minus mx. Now we need to calculate the moment produced by this 10 equivalent force about this point. And minus the distance is, how much is this distance? I need this distance, right? X minus, X minus 0 0.5. Very good, very good. So that distance is X minus 0 0.5 times the force, which is 10. And this needs to be equal to 0 to be in equilibrium. Mx equal to... Uh, minus 10x plus 5 which is also an equation very different from this one yeah look that one at the top is a quadratic equation in x this one here at the bottom is a linear equation in x yeah very different so and the reason why we have to do this separated is because of what I explained here so I hope you understand this 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 slide here yeah and now we just are just going to finish by plotting the diagrams. So we will have our beam here. Yeah. 
this is one meter. So what we have to do, we have two distinct regions of the beam. So we have, for the diagrams, we have to consider these two. So I'm, I'm, I'm leaving here for my diagrams, this region of the beam. So, and then this is going to be a different region of my beam, right? Where I will have different equations for the shear force and bending moment. So I'm going to plot here my Vx, and I'm going to plot here my Mx. And I'm going just to, so, <clears throat> yeah, one more thing we can do is, don't forget my x starts here. And what we can do now is, we can divide this into regions. So we can say for x uh, bigger than 0 and smaller than 1 meter, And I will have here another region for x greater than 1 and smaller than 3 meters. So this region is this region here, while this region is this region here. Can you see different colors, different regions on the beam? I'm just going to copy the equations here. So Vx equal to 10x. for this region, and mx equal to minus 5x squared. And for the other region, I have vx equal to 10. vx equal to 10, and the bending moment is minus 10x plus 5. Yeah? OK? And now we just need to plot this, these equations. So starting in this region here, so we have Vx. So when x is equal to 0, we have Vx equal to 0. So we have this point. x equal to 1, I have Vx equal to 10. So this point here is 10. So the shear force grows linearly from 0 to 10 in that region. Now in this region, the equation for transverse shear force is this one, Vx constant and equal to 10. So we will have something like this in this region, constant and equal to 10. Yeah? And this is, is, the, this is the distribution of the transverse shear force for that region of the beam. And now we need to go to the bending moments. The first region we have minus 5x squared. So x equal to 0, we have bending moment equal to 0. x equal to 1, we have bending moment equal to minus 5. And quadratic. OK? The other region now is linear with x. So x equal to 1, which is this first point. We have minus 10 plus 5 is minus 5, which is this same point here, minus 5. x equal to 3, we have minus 30 plus 5 is minus 25. Yeah? So we will have minus 25. And this is a linear equation in x, linear in x, so two points. I connect them with a line, and this is my distribution of the bending moment. Yeah? And now, for example, imagine you were designing that bridge that you saw in the video. What you have to do if you're designing for the bending, you need to look the critical section, the critical cross section of your beam will be the one here at the support, because it is the one with the highest bending moment equal to 25 kilonewtons meter, OK? This is the highest, right? You can see from this diagram, what this diagram here is telling you is along the span of my beam, the highest bending moment I have is at the root or at the support and equal to 25. That's why these diagrams are very helpful, yeah? So if you design your beam, your bridge, for this cross-section, 
or basically what I'm saying is that if your bridge, if the cross section at the support can carry this bending moment of 25 kilonewton meters, it means any other section of your beam will be fine because they have lower bending moments. Yeah. So basically, you only need to control this critical cross section of, of the beam. Then the bridge should be fine. Yeah. Okay. So today in the afternoon there is no one hour lecture we are going to do it on Thursday during the tutorials okay see you guys